Jackie Reese's Lead Bank, thank Hello. you for joining me. Of course, I'm happy to. So, yeah, you are a bank and yes. a fintech, all in one. Yes, I've built one and I've bought one. How did you become a bank? Tell us that story. I went and bought one. Having built one as a de novo charter at Square, it was one of the most painful experiences of my life. One of my co-founders is here, Hamam. It was probably the most painful experience of his life as well because he spent years working with the FDIC, teaching and working on algorithmic lending, for example, and going through how machine learning works. But in that process, you realize when you write the first lines of code and you write the first set of policies and procedures that you get to think about banking in a first principles mindset of like, what should this be and how would I build it? And so it really changes the framework for how you would think like, huh, I have just started from zero. I'm gonna build the ultimate bank. Now in that context, we were able to think of that, but we were only serving one customer. And so it that's became- That's at Square. That's at Square. But it made it more obvious that no one had built the bank we wanted to be. And we had worked across the industry with many of what I would describe as the best banking partners even still out there while we were at Square, and we saw many challenges as a customer. And so given that, we decided that there was a better way to do this. And there are four of us who left Square, Erica Kalili and Ronak Vias, so the, my other two co-founders, and we searched across the country for a certain profile of charter that we were looking for that we thought would maximize the opportunity of banking as a service. And we went and found the best high quality company we could, and that's Lead Bank. And Lead Bank was owned by a very old school family in Kansas City that were very well known. You know, the mom who was the chairman of the bank is the chairman of the symphony. Very philanthropic city. The banks are absolutely gorgeous. If you walk in, you'd be amazed. Are you still operating? The absolutely. Oh, We're a part wow. of the community. And, and are the owners involved anymore? We are now the owners. Yeah, so, so they're gone. We bought it 100%, but we thought very methodically about what charter we wanted, what company we wanted, what kind of employees we wanted, in what kind of location, and in what state. And so we ended up with an A plus opportunity because even if everything wasn't perfect at lead before we owned it, and there are examples where you're like, oh, that's kind of, you know, not perfect in their history. It had the infrastructure and mindset of the team that we could use to go build and continue to grow banking as a service. How big was the acquisition? about $52 million. And what was the first product that you wanted to provide? Or what, <laughs> when, it be, when you bought it, yeah. you're like, okay, now we are a FinTech bank. Like, what well, was the beginning? The best part of LEAD was that they already were a FinTech bank and they had wonderful clients. And so we were able to take what was already there and supplement with some of the world's greatest engineers. And so our engineering team is amazing. Yeah. We knew Almost everybody that we hired right out of the gate, they all came from Square, from Stripe, from Yahoo. They'd built some of the largest payment systems in the world. They built some of the largest banking systems in the world. And several of them have accounting degrees and CFAs. And so they have been through the ringer with us in prior circumstances around building out APIs for banking products. And so we took what was already a strong banking as a service partner bank and then added us, added the engineering and product team, added a much deeper compliance and legal team. And with that came extreme product market fit. And I will say extreme product market fit. And so we don't have sales, we don't have marketing, we have inbounds of people who know us, who have been credentialized through people we know, through compliance teams we know, and we have an extreme level of inbound interest in working with us. Your partners, like what are they getting? Like what is what services are you providing? 
So four main product areas, so lending, all kinds of lending APIs around any kind of card product, any kind of loan product, buy now, pay later, accounts, so either virtual accounts or actual DDAs that you might need, payment rails, so all kinds of money movement, things like that, and then issuing. And so card issuing, bin sponsorship, things like that. The only thing we don't do and don't have on our roadmap right now is acquiring. And it's just frankly because of our size. Yeah. We're about a billion one in assets right now. And when we're bigger in size, I think we'd look at doing acquiring in the future. It's just not anywhere on our, we have so much to build with such strong inbound demand. How, do you want a customer facing brand at all or you want to be facilitating other companies to build those brands? So in Kansas City, our home market, we take a really active presence and we have amazing customers. We have 3,000 customers in... Is that a regulatory strategy or...? It's a strategy to stay active in the market because the purpose of community banks in a local market is to serve the community. And we are blessed with a great group of clients, some of whom I've become really good friends with. And there's someone here from Kansas City. Where is he? Where'd you go? There he is. <laughs> he knows where we're at in Kansas City and likes how we show up. Thank you very much. And, you know, there's no reason to stop it. We have an amazing customer base. But you were saying that is the public-facing part. It is Otherwise... the public-facing part. We have an app. It's built by Fiserv. It's awful. If Frank were here, I'd ask that he update the design of that app on behalf of community banks across the United States. But that is a customer facing community bank app. And so most of the business locally is real estate developers. They're not in office. They're in mixed use kinds of activities. We don't have any issues with regard to liquidity, deposits, bad loans, the bank actually operated pretty clean from a lending point of view, and we diligence that pretty actively. And then the, the other part of the business, which is the growth, is banking as a service. But interestingly, even some of our local clients want to use like ACH Rails hmm. because they're a real estate developer and they want to work with clients to do ACH. And while their volume might be smaller because they're local, they love the fact that we could bring technology feedback to them to support their own banking needs. That's not everybody. Out of the 3,000, maybe that's 20. But it feels good to be able to change the nature of what we do in a local community and bring technology expertise to Kansas City. Who, who are State. some of your bigger customers that you can talk about? Or? There are only a few that are public. And one of our strategies is to not really talk about our customers, let them talk about us if they want to. And so we show up on a few websites like Ramp and Affirm, a few other fintechs like Flex and Credit Key. But otherwise, I don't know that anyone's put us on their website, so I won't comment. Our clients are some of the biggest e-commerce fintech, big and scaling also, fintech, e-commerce, consumer companies. We have many public companies on our rails. We have many up and comers of people that came through our network that we know that we wanna help support, that we feel like have really good, strong teams. We know who they are, we know who their compliance teams are. And so we vet all the inbounds, but thankfully we're part of the tech community. So we usually know these folks and through someone in our network, we have pretty good insight into what kind of operator they are and what the perspective is on the likely growth of their business. And so we do have several small small clients on our rails. Um, and then we also have some crypto companies on our yeah. rails. And we're one of the only banks in the US that's been through a full three-year exam with crypto that has been included in our bank. And I, and I think that do you when, when we went through those exams, I think it's because the depth of understanding of the team and the type of enhanced due diligence we did with those clients in order to take fiat only currency, I think they believed through our behavior, through the understanding of the products that we were able to understand how to do enhanced due diligence and what to look for with red flags. Outside of the community bank, do you hold a lot of customer deposits on behalf of these companies or it's mostly money passing through? So part of the strategy with fintechs is that 
in some cases for some of the products there is more liquidity that stays on your balance sheet. In some cases it's very short duration. In other cases it's you know holding customer funds on behalf of a fintech because we work with fintechs to try to be a good partner to them and rate is one component of being a good partner to them. Rate is not our strategy though and by any stretch of the imagination what we build and how we execute from a technology point of view is the strategy. And so I'd say they come to us first for the way we build products and the way we operate from a compliance point of view and the way we are foundationally strong financially. How we operate across the balance sheet is just one component of how, the How do you substantiate that, substantiate that you're financially strong? Or what, what are the key signals? Oh, so then this was something that came up in the last discussion is people have to do due diligence on us. And thankfully, we report numbers to the FDIC every quarter. And so everyone can pull up our call report. And we advise fintechs before they choose a bank to go do reverse diligence what on us. What are the us. key numbers? Give us some of the, what will we find? We did about 140 million in sales last year, 55 million of what I'd describe as gross profit and 16.4 million in net income. And so we're billion one in assets. Those numbers are publicly available. There's nothing secretive about them. You're supposed um, to position this as a big group now. The big reveal. No, but you know, it's interesting as a size point of view because we're actually a pretty big partner bank size. You know, most people want to partner with someone below the Durban size, which is $10 billion. So that they can make money on interchange? Well, you can make money either way. It's just a matter of the how the fees are calculated. But it's it's more that there aren't that many that are actually that big in scale. There's a handful. And then when you look by product, there are only a handful that are good at different kinds of products. And so we've already distinguished ourselves. You know, we bought this bank about two years ago. We've already distinguished ourselves in size pretty substantially and kind of separated ourselves from a, you know, a pack of, of smaller players. And so when people do due diligence on us, first of all, like our CFO's bio is extraordinary. Then you talk to her and you're like, this woman knows what she is doing. She was the ex CFO of post bankruptcy Lehman Brothers. And so she managed the entire dissolution of their $132 billion balance sheet and has been, had been working there for 10 years. And before that ran FP&A at Willis. And so she has an extreme level of detailed understanding of complexity of balance sheet at scale. And she has a detailed understanding of how to build unusual balance sheet structures in order to support the financing needs of clients. Then, I'd make one more point, she doesn't come from tech, so she can look at us and call bullshit and say like, yeah, I get that, yeah, we're not gonna do that and let's figure out why and what makes sense and why you're gonna do something. And it helps makes the conversation better when you're not all coming from a closed ecosystem of understanding, you wanna have divergent perspectives in order to make the conversation smarter. And so she's a very can-do person. I think she has an incredible approach, but when a client goes and you know, asks her questions about how we manage risk, how we manage intraday, Money flows, because I do think that's going to be the challenge of banks for the next few years because of the complexity of money moving soon 24-7, 365. There's not enough volume yet, but it's coming. And all the flows amongst all the counterparties are still not aligned yet. And so, you know, I wanted someone who was going to understand that complexity. So you're saying just the speed of money movement is going to become the core issue, or I just want to speed understand. of money movement, velocity of what flows intraday, because most of the metrics that are looked at are measured at ends of periods. Ends of are not a distinctive moment for liquidity challenges, and in some cases there's mismatches of windows that operate between all different kinds of counterparties. That might be fine where you have closed Fed windows, and I think Matt touched on this a little bit, but when you are in a world with Fed now and 24-7 money movement, you have to make sure that every counterparty can pull to the same moment in time. And today, that's not the case. Big question, but what is your yeah, broad read on 
regulatory friendliness to fintechs right now, or how much has sort of regulatory scrutiny changed how you operate? Where you operate within the guidelines and confines of the regulation, I haven't seen issues. Full stop. Where you're able to actually answer questions and substantively step back with a framework of understanding around how your cl clients operate, KYC, KYB, red flags, I haven't seen any issues. Full stop. Now, that doesn't mean that regulators are necessarily forward-looking to take proactive views of you know, how the market's moving, and they're not on their forefront, or their, their, their forward foot trying to change the way banking operates to experiment. But last I checked, when the American taxpayer is insuring banks, I don't know that, that we all as taxpayers want banking regulators to be flippant about risks that banks are taking. And so, you know, you hope that where there's innovation and features of what people are doing around the edges, that regulators will operate and understand them. But I think they need to see data first. And, you know, I'm pretty thankful that they're pretty detailed in their analysis. And so where you have very high profile, high class, very strong compliant customers, I think they operate you know, quite safely within the context of banks that they work with. Do you have to say no to your clients a lot or it's more just building the product in a way it's, that they could It's definitely not a no. It's most of our clients are super high quality. They want to scale and they want to scale safely. Having a mistake from a banking point of view is existential. No one wants to do something stupid. And so the situation I am more likely to see is not understanding something. And when you explain it with a strong rationale, I rarely see instances of debate. But if you're taking a position on something, I'll give you an example. It used to drive me crazy that a bank I worked with in Utah would not let us do CBD loans. And it used to drive me crazy, because I would say like, okay, but now, so when I go into Whole Foods, let's see, I mapped it out on Google, and I think they're a half mile from you. When I go into Whole Foods and I buy CBD bubble bath, and I put it on my Visa card, and then that runs through Stripe, you're telling me that those products aren't banked, you know, in, in however, and they're like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And you'd get like an answer of like, yeah, that seems kind of ridiculous, but let me just shrug my shoulders and say like, yeah, I don't get it, but we're not changing. Those answers are illogical. And if in fact you, and the way we try to respond to clients, respond with a better answer, better advice, a can-do approach to solving their problems, we usually get pretty thankful people who are happy we've got their back. Open, open to questions while people think about it. What, when you started LEAD, or now managing it, what was the main sort of leadership lesson you learned from your time at Square? What, what did you take from Square, or what did you reject when you started it? So when I was at Square, I oversaw hundreds of licenses. So I ran a very heavy, heavily regulated part of Square. I was not just a tech executive or you know, an engineer or a product manager. I sat on top of lending and banking and I started a bank, First Principles. And the thing I saw at Square, which I consider to be a very strong, innovative FinTech, was that owning a bank and operating a bank is a 10x delta in understanding compliance to working in a tech company. And the language you use and the mode of operation and the way that you run a company is night and day different. And even if you think, because you sit on licenses like MTLs, which is often what I hear, oh, we have MTLs, we know what we're doing. Oh, this is a different world. And, and so my learning, I got to learn, thankfully, in the context of Square and living it every day, was to appreciate the complexity of what it takes to do this so that we could learn how to serve our clients better and help them scale, but make sure we never put ourselves in a position to risk the relationship that we have operating with our regulators.
Question? One of the questions I had was around this trend towards like real-time payments, kind of money being moved instantly, 24-7, um, and kind of gearing up towards you know a world where we do have instant money movement. Like, What are the things that you're thinking about for a lead bank that you need to have to be prepared to be able to facilitate you know this huge volume to make sure that there's you know you're covered in terms of like anti-fraud just curious high level like how are you thinking about that transition yeah for us around real-time payments i don't think there's anything from a technology point of view that we need to do today to be prepared for that we actually haven't connected to fed now yet even though Mark Gold, who runs it, I know very well from the Fed. I have the world's most like unbelievable respect for him. We worked at the San Francisco Fed together. I would, was an advisor to them for nine years. And he's amazing. And he's methodically going through the roadmap. But we didn't have client demand for it. And so we just decided not to hook it up until we're ready. But our APIs and the way that we operate as a pl platform as soon as we're ready, we're going to connect to Fed now, and I don't think there's anything we need to change. We're kind of, we are ready. And I think that's because of the sophistication of the systems we built thus far. And so whether it be any of the core money movement APIs or even our anomaly detection system, I think we're prepared for it from a fraud point of view. I do think they need more volume going through the system. And... You know, up to now, they've only had a few hundred banks involved. And at some point, they have enough functionality. They open up the dollar value of each transaction you're allowed to send. And the functionality grows enough that it actually can be an unbelievable platform. And that's when I think you're going to see unbelievable growth. Do you think that Lead Bank is a model for community banking in general? given there are lots of questions about the future of community banking. You know, I don't, in a sense. One of the things that I think is problematic about many of the banks that have operated in banking as a service is that they've done it opportunistically. They've fallen into a client because of a lawyer, an accountant, an advisor, or it came through their local area by fluke. But they're working with people who I don't think truly understand the products, and that's when I think banks get into trouble if they're not able to explain the products to regulators, all of a sudden you get a very squishy feeling that it's unclear that they've done the appropriate amount of compliance, KYB, KYC checks that they need to be doing, or even red flags, SARS, you name it. And so I do, I'm very weary of banks trying to be opportunistic of doing that. Having said that, I do think there are models for banks to deploy technology in a better way than they do. And I think that would help community banking if their apps were better, if they were able to use applications that other fintechs who serve banks sell into that channel. And so I do think there's a market for them to deploy third-party technology in order to offer different kinds of services. I see a need for community banking. I see what we do at a local level, it, even though I'm the biggest advocate for lending in context of where transactions happen. I think there's an and, not an or. And the and is being part of a local community and lending to people that a fintech might not reach or supporting part of the community at the most local level with entrepreneurs who come in, you know, and hang out in your office on a Tuesday and, you know, learn different financial skills. I just, there's so many things that happen in order to make the texture of a community better. And so I don't know that we need 4,000 banks, but we certainly need community banking across the United States to thrive. And so I do hope technology more integrates into the banks as opposed to banks deciding that they can necessarily go build for, you know, the most sophisticated technology companies in the world. Just, just you get the last word, like a zoom out sort of question. You know, it feels like sort of coming out of the wilderness or hopefully if there aren't more bank crises, you know, it's like Silicon Valley went through this SVB crisis, FRB, there were the crypto banks, and then fintech overall is retrenched. You know, 
would you tell somebody to start a fintech company today, or what message would you give people about what they should do going forward, reacting to sort of all these, I don't know, traumas? Yeah, absolutely. I think you heard uh, in our last presentation, it's, you know, a huge part of the economy. $25 trillion of assets sit in the banking system. And the one thing I think is amazing about fintech is that it provides real functionality that everybody uses every day. And so I do think there's such an incredible market opportunity. You know, it's really just open to creativity. Now, I think it's actually harder to build fintechs than it is many other kinds of companies because precision and regulation are two components of the ecosystem and value chain that have to be built, where in some cases you don't need precision. And so I think there's incredible utility that fintechs provide. And because it's such an important part of the US economy, and because banking is such an old industry where more than 50% of the market cap is over 50 years old, there's an incredible room for invention everywhere along financial services, including in consumer companies. And this idea of having banking and financial transactions happen in context of where you are. It doesn't have to look like a bank app in order to be banking. Great, Jackie, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.